This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's yep. guest, we've got Robin Horsfall. Robin, how are you? Nice to see you, James. Good to see you, brother. <laughs> Unbelievable story. SAS. Served all over the world. Offer. Bodyguard. Martial arts expert. A man of many talents. I've watched a few of your interviews. You've done the, the, Iranian, is it the Iranian embassy in 1980. 1980, that, yeah. That one yeah. of the best rescue missions, I believe. Yeah, rescued 19 hostages, yeah. Yeah. That's mad. I love this shit. We're going to have a good conversation yeah, today. Sure. But before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Ah, well, I was um, I was born in 1957, which is only 12 years after the end of the Second World War, Second World War. And my mum was 17 years old and my father was in prison. And so for the first seven years of my life, I never had a father figure. And I felt that um, that lack of something important mm -hmm. for a long, long time afterwards. Um, and uh, she got divorced and married a guy called Jeffrey Horsfall, who adopted me and gave me his name when I was seven, eight years old. Not quite sure. Um, but Jeffrey's um, way of dealing with uh, children, he had no experience of kids, I had no experience of fathers, was to um, beat me into silence. And so I say that he stole my voice. Um, because when you're beaten into silence, you lose your ability to communicate, to negotiate, to um, disagree with people, to make friends, to even laugh. Um, and there's an awful lot of young people um, from my background who had similar experiences in their lives. It can make you quite bitter. I mean, adversity can make you a better person, but it certainly creates character. It can also make you a bad person. Um I was a bright kid. I was doing well at school. I got into grammar school when I was 11. Um, but uh, my parents, my mother's second marriage started to fall apart, and so did my education. And so when I was 14, I walked into the Army Careers Information Office in Aldershot and uh, asked to join the Army. And I asked to join the Royal Army Medical Corps. And um, by the time when I was 15, I was old enough because school leaving age was 15 in 1972. The last year it was 15, and I joined the Infantry Junior Leaders Battalion as a member of the Parachute Regiment. Oh, so nice. rather than patching people up, I was more, in, more, more inclined to uh, be trained to kill people. Um, and I was there for two and a quarter years, and that was formative, that was foundational. It was my right to passage into adulthood, and it gave me direction. I had mentors, I had guns and canoes and mountains and uh, lots and lots of other young men of similar age uh, to work towards the future. And at that time, there were 13,000 boy soldiers in the British Army. And um, most of them became the middle class and the, the employers of the future. They weren't just soldiers. We had apprentice colleges, we had technical colleges, we had everything. And it's sad that that's not there as an opportunity for boys who were like me at that time today. 
Do you see the weakness in children now with iPads and computers and not enough outdoors? Back in the day, yeah. 80s, when I was born, it was football outside. We were building big dens. Mm. We were playing under fire hydrants. We were doing bad shit, but it was, I believe it was a learning curve as well yeah. to learn. You know, a lot of bad boys grew up to be uh, good men, given yeah. an opportunity. Um, you can't blame them for the changes in technology and the changes in the world. But um, what you can do is you can blame the government for the lack of opportunity that is there for less academic people, for young people that have got a future but don't want to necessarily go to college, that don't want to go to university, um, that haven't been happy at school. Because those guys used to go out on the markets they became some of them became captains of industry like alan sugar um they found their own way they um the academic route isn't the only route in the world and i've walked both um but there's no opportunity and people also live in fear so whereas your parents just said right see you when you get home be home for your tea and didn't worry about where you were and the trouble you got into and that you were scrumping vi mason's plums off her trees and so on um they weren't worried um you, off you went life was a risk they'd just gone through the second world war career was taking place um you know it's um it's a dangerous world but um we've got into a situation now where everybody's so frightened frightened your kids will get run, run over on the world on the roads frightened that they're going to get bullied in the playground and so everybody's supervised um i taught kids in london for 25 years from the age of four up to 15 i taught the martial arts and um it was interesting to see some of the kids from very affluent homes that lacked a father because the father was always at work the nanny would bring up the kids the mother lived in absolute fear of allowing her children to be out of her sight for one minute. And although they took part in lots of activities, they were never unsupervised activities. Yeah. Did you, what was the decision to join the army? Was it to get away from the stepdad or? No, I, I, I don't think I realized um, how difficult my situation was at home, although I lived in abject fear of him. So getting out of the house and going fishing and camping with my mates by the pond every friday night until sunday evening was partly it about getting away from him but no i think I'd, i tried to join the army because i knew i was failing at school i wasn't happy at school and um i was underachieving and i wasn't happy with that so i needed to run away from that and find something new and um the army was what i made the choice there's a there's a scene in an officer and a gentleman with richard gear an old film where he's fighting with the black sergeant major and um, the black sergeant major puts him on his ass and he's laying there and he says, why don't you go home? I've no and, to go. Ge and gear looks at him and says, I've got nowhere else to go. And I think that was me in my first year in the British army. I had nowhere else to go. There's nothing to go back to. Um, and, uh, it, it made me eventually, uh, a stronger, kinder, happier person. Were you angry before you joined the army? Oh God. Yes. Um, I don't, yeah, I think I was angry because I was I was beaten. I think I was angry because I was bullied, uh, bullied by my stepfather initially. Um, I struggled to make friends with my peers when I joined the army. There I am in a room of twelve young men from all the all the worst and toughest cities in the UK, and I didn't know how to negotiate and communicate and be a man. I didn't know how to laugh at myself or Josh or um, go, yeah, 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 I'm a tosser. <laughs> I didn't know how to do that. I took everything very, very seriously. And um, that isolated me and it made it very, very, very difficult. And um, so the anger persisted um, and I learned to fight, but um, I had to fight my way back. That meant going through everybody and um, in order to fight your way back through a series of people, you have to be worse than them. You have to be more violent than them, more aggressive, more capable, more vicious. But I had some very, very good teachers, and nearly all of them were Scottish. <laughs> what? The Scottish in the SES? <laughs> I, I know probably everybody says that, but I'd love to put myself through the test. I believe my mindset is different from a lot of people, but you, you never truly knew that until you're through the test. But I believe a lot of Scottish do pass... SES selection as well so there must be it could be generational thing it could be a DNA thing but there's something not quite right in fact with the UK the thing about I love about the UK first of all we don't 
We don't tolerate bullies. There's a lot, a lot of bullies, but we don't fuck around with them. If I have, I'd like to think I could handle myself to a certain degree, but if I've ever seen somebody get bullied, I'd be the first to fucking mm. say, listen, I don't like bullies, I never have. And I think in the <coughs> UK, we see through bullshit as well. We're quite intelligent that way. We can see through a lot of pish, but with this, the training and the anger and everything you were learning from such a young age, when did you realise that it was becoming too much? You are becoming too vicious? You were going in the opposite direction? You were becoming your stepdad? No, I did never, never, I never became a bully. Mm -hmm. um, I, I became um, the archetypal soldier. My mother died when she was 37 of cancer. And so that made me an army orphan. Um, so the army was my home. The army was my family, the parachute regiment, the biggest, toughest, meanest sons of bitches on the street. You know, um, they, they said it as it was, you sorted your problems out with your fists. And if you couldn't, you shouldn't be there because the sole purpose of a paratrooper is to fight. And, um, and I eventually came to love that. I came to love that honesty and I loved it because it gave me an outlet for my frustrations as well. Um, it didn't make me a lot of friends. Um, I was still that sort of odd person on the sidelines, but I went from when I was 19, um, two guy, two drunks came into a room late one night and, uh, nearly beat me to death. Um, they, um, it took 10 days for my, be able to open the bruising on my eyes to see my face in the mirror. I had a dislocated jaw, fractured jaw, fractured fingers. Um, I had been attacked with a, with a razor, um, and it took me um, it took me it took me six weeks to get home from uh, Cyprus, and they didn't do it because it was me. They just did it because they were drunk and wanted to beat somebody up. And at that point, I turned from being, you know, Rob the uncomfortable uh, person who didn't fit in to Bad Bob, the person who was going to be in a fight every night if someone was looking for it. And Old Shop was an easy place to find a fight. It was probably the most violent place I've ever lived in my life. It was a garrison town. It was owned by the um, airborne forces. And I didn't go picking on people. But as I said, if someone was looking for it, I was giving it to them first. Um, and the only thing that actually changed that was when I met my wife, when I was uh, on SAS selection when I was 21. And for the first time in my life, I had somebody who um, saw through that facade and um, got into the cage with the lone wolf and tickled his ears. And uh, 40, 40, 44 years later, we're still together. Yeah. Congratulations. It's funny that the biggest, biggest and baddest men, that's all we want is a little back rub and a little tick <laughs> of the ear that kind of calms the bear. But do you see that now? Obviously, with your experience, the most violent, the most ruthless are the ones who are hurting the most? Yeah, I think um, an awful lot of aggression comes from fear. An awful lot of aggression comes from the pain and um, and fear of being uh, intimidated, humiliated is the big one, and um, silenced by other people. So you don't feel you've got a voice in society. Nobody's listening to you. And the only way to be listened to is to stand up and, uh, and shout and be prepared to fight for it. Um, but you can get um, people who are abused, who become extraordinarily violent, and they um, they compensate, or they don't know what else to do. They see everybody as a threat. I used to walk around the world when I was bodyguarding, when I was in the SAS, and the first thing I would do when I saw a stranger was plan how I would take them out if they started something. That was the first thing that went through my head, and it took me a long time to realize that that's not normal. Survival. That's weird. I mean, it was... It was the circumstances I'd, I'd grown up in from the age of 15. I lived in an extraordinarily violent world with violent people, and it was normal. Um, when I got to Hereford to do SAS selection for the first time, I'd been in Aldershot for five, six years um, as my main base. And the girls in Hereford used to say, oh, we can see the new guys from Aldershot that have arrived in Hereford because they, they watch everybody come through the door, they've got their backs to the wall, and then after a few weeks, you start to calm down. But um, you just live in that world. And it's the same as, in some ways, of being in battle. You know, when you're in battle, you're on edge all the time. You're on, you're on a knife edge. You're, every bang, every flash, every movement is, is potentially a threat. Everything, everything that's unexpected is a threat. Yeah. So you can see how 
people come back and have difficulties transitioning from that back into the civilian world. What was the training like to get into the paras back then? This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. Yeah, the parachute regiment training is uh, all about aggression and fierceness and soldiering. And uh, you are uh, coerced. You are brutalized to a degree. Um, You're not beaten up. Um, but, you know, you're expected to sort your problems out of your fists, not go whining to somebody. Um, so it was the, the change from boy soldiers to parachute regiment training was a step up in aggression more than anything else. And um, But the, the physical side of it, uh, having been a boy soldier for two years, wasn't that hard. It was the step up to being a, an airborne soldier that was the hard bit. Mm-hmm. And... Um, um, of the 48 that passed out of my platoon, only three were not uh, former junior soldiers from either the junior parachute company or infantry junior leaders. Um, and um, the sort of fitness, the soldiering, we already had that in spades, but the aggression was a huge step up. Yeah, my, my sister's ex-partner, his brother, Barry, he was in the Paris, but he, every time he came home, he was just fucking causing trouble mm. left, right, and centre. I loved the paints. Great guy, man. Funny bastard, but he, he, he was wee, but he could fucking scrap. Yeah. He could yeah. scrap. He was yeah. a tough bastard, and nobody fucked with him, man. And it, yeah, and I always remember telling me the stories about the Paris because I tried, I tried to join the Marines. And he's like, they're full of fucking pussies, man. Come to well, if you weren't good enough for the Marines, you'd never got in the Paris. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually, yeah, it was just mad, but. See, the training, do you feel as if kids should go through some sort of... I believe all kids should be taught combat. T- not toughen them up, but it gives them... Every time I spar or do any sort of combat training, I feel like a man. I feel yeah. alive. I'm scared doing it. I'm, I'm, I'll admit that. I get scared doing it, but I know I've got the balls to still do it. And after that, it's like a release. Do you feel as if kids should be doing more combat or some sort of military training? Not to kill her with no, guns or whatever, but just to... There's a rite of passage that... A lot of societies in the world have. We used to have national service really, as an example, um, where you go through this rite of passage um, and after you've been through it, you're a man. You're classed as an adult. Um, as far as combat's concerned, um, an awful lot of healthy family environments involve dad wrestling on the floor with his sons and daughters. You know, and that physical wrestling and that physical contact creates confidence in yourself you know i can take this i can handle this i can deal with this and so that's the first place that um people masculine boys should be encouraged to engage in because it builds their self-confidence there are some boys that aren't masculine and so you know they shouldn't be forced to do it but uh, they'll go in a different direction but um, i think for the majority of um of masculine young men um, wrestling with your dad, wrestling with your uncle, wrestling with one another, um, getting the fat, getting a fat lip every now and then, or learning that you can take a little bit of punishment without um, without crying your eyes out every single time and running off to mummy. You know, that's I think that's all part of the healthy process. Um, when I was teaching kids martial arts in Southwest London, um, you know, parents would come to me and say, "Well, little Johnny, he, he loves the the cata part of." the process but he doesn't want to do the sparring i said does he play football i said yeah he plays football i says does he do the tackling and of course he does the tackling i said well he's got to do this as well because it's part of the process that's what it's about and it's not about beating people up it's making them mentally and physically comfortable with themselves and confident in themselves and strong um, because strong men are kind men vicious men are not strong the most dangerous person in a gang is the weakest one because he's the one likely to do something vindictive and malicious and violent, uh, whereas the stronger, more capable ones don't need to prove themselves. Yeah, I, I used to, when I used to drink a lot, 
in the pub, everybody was loud. We were full of drugs and drink. We were all loud. We thought mm. we were gangsters and tough men. We were all fucking weak. <coughs> and then I started training in a place called the Grip House in Glasgow. It was MMA. I used to train with a guy called Sean Wright. Mm -hmm. They all looked like skateboarders. They all looked kind of long hair. And you wouldn't think, these guys are trained fucking killers. But yeah, they'll just sit in the pizza shop or go for a, a drink, one or two beers. But yeah, all the assholes like me and mm. my friends were all loud and daft and just so insecure. But the trained killers, they were so pleasant, so nice. They didn't have to prove anything. I always felt as if try to prove something so you could fit in and people thought you were crazy because you knew deep inside you were so sensitive, so weak, so afraid. And it's scary to think you don't realise that till later on in life. Nobody ever really teaches you because I learned through my uncles and when they were drunk and, mm -hmm. and it's, it becomes normalised yeah. of the drink, drugs and violence, not realising that's all a weakness. Everyone's pretending to be a hard man. Yeah. Everybody's... Um, everybody thinks they're on train spotting and Robert Carlyle. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, I, 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 the one thing I loved about, there's only two um, actors that I've ever seen on television in any film, anywhere, anytime, who can p portray the viciousness that I experienced during my time in the parachute regiment. Joe Pesci and Carlyle? It was Carlyle and, um, and Billy Connolly. Billy when Connolly? He played the gangster, yeah. And do you know why they could do it? Because they'd lived it. Mm -hmm. They'd seen it. They'd seen it in people's eyes. And that Carlisle, when he's in train spotting, has it. He has it right down to a T. Oh, and maybe even um um who was it played the um uh it'll come to me if I don't think about it, but one other American actor, blonde hair, very handsome. Um it'll come to me. DiCaprio? No. He's a fucking no, 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 not DiCaprio. He played the um he played the Pikey Fighter. In um, oh, Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt, yes, when he played that part, and he leaps out of his chair and his eyes just whack. And I just, yes, you got that, Brad. You just got it so good, yeah, so perfect. You know, somebody like that because mm -hmm. that's the only way you can do it. I mean, I've watched all the movies about SAS guys and the television series and the um, you know, the actors on that, and no, that none of them, none of them know it, none of them have seen it, and none of them can act it. See, when you were going through the Paris then, like, what was the procedures to go SES training? How long did you have to do? <laughs> it was a go there was a cock a, to cock a snoot at authority. I'd been in the vigilant platoon, which was like the wild bunch of the parachute regiment, <clears throat> the guided, the special guided missile platoon. If, if, if they're bad, but if you're too much trouble for the battalion, send them to Vig. And, um, and I loved Vig. It was all soldiering, no bullshit, no parades, out on the ground all the time. And, um, but a new missile came in called the Milan. And so we were disbanded. And when we were disbanded, we were told we could go back to our parent units. And my parent unit was the 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, which was also 60% um, Scottish. <laughs> um, and, um, and then they changed their mind. So they promised us something. And then they said, no, you can't go back. You're going to stay in one para. And, um, and I thought, well, you promised me. You've broken your promise. I'm going to do something you can't stop me doing. And so I went to the battalion clerk's office and... Um, and said, uh, I was 21, and I said, I want the papers to join the Special Air Service. And there's always a Yorkshireman at the back of the battalion clerk's office. Every battalion has got a Yorkshireman in the battalion clerk's office. And this bloke at the back said, I don't know why you're doing that horse for. He said, you're far too young. You'll be back with your tail between your legs, you wanker. And, um, and he was wrong. <laughs> but I just did it because they, they broke a promise to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gone there because I understood that you needed to be 27 to get in on average. And I was 20. I was just coming up 22. Do you think all the pain and all the torture you went through as a kid <clears throat> made you who you were to pass the election? Or did you always have that in you without I think, all the shit you went through? I think I had a deep-seated insecurity that um, I needed to prove that I was as good as the next man. Always. Uh, if you've been bullied... Um, you and uh, you, and isolated and humiliated. You, you. There's always a something subliminal inside you that makes you feel inadequate. And so I always had this desire to prove that I was as good, not better than, but as good as the others, those that had criticised me. And so um, I had a deep-seated insecurity that was driving me forwards. But I also wanted to be one of the best. And I wanted to wear that cap badge because there were only 250 badge soldiers in the British Army. And I still think the number's very much the same even now. And uh, to get into the SAS is nothing 
nothing like any of the TV nonsense that people watch. Any of it. And it shall be nameless, but we know what we're talking about. There's no shouting at people. There's no coercion. There's no bullying. There's no sickness. It's just simply... If they made a genuine television program about SAS selection, it would be so boring. Because on the first month, the last week is test week. Test week is the equivalent of five marathons over five days with weight on your back alone over the mountains of the Brecon Beacons in Wales. If you make the time, great. If you don't make the time, you go back to your unit the next day. No questions asked. Um, you just didn't pass. Um, you go on then to do continuation training, most of which is in the jungle. And when you come back from that, you're reselected again and a percentage fail. And then you go on to combat survival training for another month. And when you finish that, you're reselected again. And if you're already a paratrooper, you're then given your cat badge, but you're on probation for six months. If you're not already a paratrooper, you go and do your basic jumps. In the next six months, you have to learn a personal skill and you have to learn a troop skill. My personal skill was qualifying as a paramedic and my troop skill was mountain climbing. And at the end of 12 months, if the lads like you, if you're doing well, then you're allowed to stay in for another two years and you're qualified on paper as an SAS soldier. So the selection is a year and it's as academic as it, as, as it is physical. How many started that with you? Um, I had to have two goes. The first time I, I didn't make it. Um, but I, um, what about I, the big Yorkshireman who says you're going to have your thing yeah well you? that was another reason I, I thought oh, I'm going to go back and face him but, could, um, you fa could you do it again <laughs> as well because as can some selections I don't think you can reset they the asked first. me um, I, it was on the mountain phase in the first month mm -hmm. and um, I'd um, I hadn't put enough protection at the bottom of my back and so the Bergen had eaten when it got up to 55 pounds it was eating two great big ulcers in the back of me and so on day four of test week, um, I quit and went to went back and they said, um, uh, okay, horse, we'll pack your kit, you're going back tomorrow. But I got called into the office the next morning and said, look, we think you, uh, you know, we, saw, we know about your back, the medics have told us about your back, uh, would you like to stay here for another four months and do it again in January? So I stayed until January and January 79, I did selection again, which was the coldest winter on record for the last 40 years. <laughs> How many people passed that? Uh, eight. See, when you're, I'd like to think I'm a judge, good judge of character, especially <clears throat> now. But some people do shock me, and I think, wow, I never thought him. Did you? Did you see who was passing at the start, or did you? Were you quite surprised who passed? I was. Um, I don't think I was surprised initially, um, but we had one person die on endurance, the forty mile march on the last last day of test week. And uh, nobody got to the first checkpoint because the, we the weather was so bad. And when we got back from the jungle, um, there were still 22 of us and they only allowed 10 of us to carry on. Um, and I was quite surprised because I thought some of the ones they failed were extremely good. I thought they were better than me. Um, but I wasn't making the choices. I was just glad to get through. Seven people went into the office before me and all, the, first six fa the first seven failed. And I was the eighth one to go and the first one to come out who'd passed. Uh, onto the next phase, just onto the next phase. Um, but 10 of us went on and two others failed after that. Uh, one collapsed because we had to do endurance again. And um, one um, failed the interrogation process, um, uh, which um, Andy McNabb has written about in his book. So it's safe enough to mention it. But one failed that. So there was, um, there was eight of us left at the end. Did you feel six were paratroopers? These are mad bastards. Did you did you ever feel satisfied, or was there always something <clears throat> missing with you, Robin? Uh, yeah, I think as as time and qualifications um, uh, were were accumulated, and the, I mean, I, I met my I met my wife while I was on selection. I married her um, in nineteen eighty one. Um, and so I was building a family as well as a career. And um, the army was me. The SAS was me. That was where I was going to be until I was 40. But unfortunately, like as in a lot of institutions, it only takes one person to rank higher than you to destroy your career. And I had one person, a rank, two people actually, a rank higher than me who set out to destroy my career. And they stitched me up for something I hadn't done which is in my book, Fighting Scared. Mm -hmm. And um, and so rather than allow them to 
return me to unit and send me back my tail between my legs, um, I purchased my discharge from the army when I was 27 and uh, went on to different things. What's the hardest part of SAS selection for you? <clears throat> I think the um, for, for, for selection for me, the hardest part was um, the mountain part, the physical part. My map reading had to be absolutely spot on because my fitness wasn't going to compensate for it. I mean, five five marathons over five days is pretty awesome anyway. Um, but um, I couldn't afford to make a mistake, so my map reading needed to be really, really good. And fortunately, it was. Um, but, you know, we were, we were working in snow. Marches that would take you eight hours in the summer were taking 11 hours in the winter. How did you manage to do the five marathons in five days? Is that part of selection? <coughs> well, with, that is the test week. After the rucksacks as well? Yeah, you, you, you start off on day one. Test week is five days. Mm -hmm. The first day is 18 miles. The second day is 22 miles. The third day is 27 miles. The fourth day is 18 miles, but with a, with a sketch map. So it's a drawing rather than a real map. So it's far more than that. And the fifth day is 40 miles. So add all those together. You're working alone on the mountains, uh, going from checkpoint to checkpoint, and you have to make the times. What about the, the kid who died in the SAS selection? What the fuck happened to him? <clears throat> well, he was actually not on selection. He was one of, um, he was a major who was coming out for a walk with us from the first, from the start point to the first checkpoint. We'd been up there for a month. We knew what the weather was like. Um, he was a marvelous, he was a major. He was a marvelous guy. He was a hero um, from the Battle of Murbat. Um, but um, we got up on the first ridge. The wind was hitting us at 40 miles an hour from the left. The rain was hitting the snow and uh, turning into ice. Um, and um, he started to go down with um, hypothermia. And um, we opened up his um, Bergen and he didn't have wet weather and warm weather clothing in it or even a sleeping bag. So the guys um, gave him some of theirs, dug a snow hole, and one of the guys called Simon stayed in the snow hole with him to try and keep him warm. And um, But nobody got to the first checkpoint. The guys that went forward went down into a valley and broke into the water pumping station and sheltered for the night. I turned around and went back to the start point. And I got to the start point and looked at the sergeant major in the, in the vehicle and said, Lofty, somebody's going to die up there today. I didn't know that this snow hole had been dug at the time. I didn't know what had happened to the major. And um, he said, get in the back. Um, it was warm in the valley. You couldn't see through the cloud and they didn't realize how bad it was on the top. The next day, A squadron went out uh, to do mountain rescue or G squadron, I think it was A squadron. And um, they rescued Simon and uh, the major, but the major had died of hypothermia during the night. Um, the rest of the guys um, were rescued from the water pumping station. So, yeah, it was, um, it was a pretty... Uh, it, you cannot imagine that weather unless you've been on top of wet, cold Welsh or Scottish mountains mm. um, in the middle of January with um, with that kind of just above zero wetness that goes with the cold. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's pretty appalling. So you pass selection, you're in the SAS, you're married to the woman that you love. Life going pretty good then? You're enjoying life? You've got kind of living two lives, a man who goes into operations that no one knows, being that mad, ruthless, I'm a man, I don't take no shit no more, to then being the loving kind of husband. And did you feel as if it was two lives as well and life going amazing? Well, no, it was part of it because I met my wife when I was on selection. So she knew you were a mad bastard anyway. So what she married, <laughs> she met when I was there. Yeah. Um, and um, she's the most extraordinary human being. Um, she saw through uh the facade to see who i really was she she gave i'd say she gave me back my humanity how was that at the start though with the bold and brass and i can fight anyone mentality to someone seeing straight through it because in glasgow when you sometimes you look at someone and somebody will say what the fuck are you looking at that's just because you're scared of actually seeing through who they were if she's seen through who you were was it a nervous thing or were you put the blockers on it or did you drop your guard straight away i think some of it you'd have to ask her I mean, that would be a wonderful interview mm -hmm. um, because she's so honest and direct and funny as well. But she she already had two baby girls. 
so she, and she had big sisters and she loved children. She, she would say to me, I know we'll never get married, but if we ever did, and she persistent and persistent and persistent. And um, it took her two weeks to tell me she loved me. It took me three years to say it back. Um, and uh, she taught me how to show my true feelings, how to express my love for her and later for my children and to be proud of it and to enjoy it. And it didn't make you soft or weak because that business of being able to deal with problem people was still there. Um, it just need, it just meant that it wasn't something I had to prove anymore. Um, I've between us, we've had five children. We've got 10 grandchildren and six great grandchildren and um, they've all done very well and I'm proud of them all for different reasons. Um, but I think that that tight, united family unit and the balance between her femininity and my masculinity made um, a really strong and foundations for a, for, a, for a good family and good children. Yeah, Did she, she, That's what, it's such important to have a good woman in life. It's such important to... For someone to see your vulnerability and someone to see your scared, and but as men we don't show it often, but I believe that's where the strength is. I believe that's when you can have greatness, when you can do both, have the masculine and the, the feminine, and it comes together. Where that's why there's different. <coughs> everybody's got different chromosomes: X, 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 Y, masculinity, femininity. It's there for a reason. It's fifty-fifty, mm. but it's trying to get someone who. It's easy to love somebody for their great points. But you talk about the dark stuff, mm. my faults, my insecurities, my jealousy, my controlling nature. And somebody can go, wait a minute, you don't actually do that because I'm not going to hurt you. That's fucking beautiful. Because you're not saying I love you for three years as a reason. because mm. you're fucking scared. I actually do love you, but I don't want to say it because then if you do leave me, I didn't really love you. So it's like a protection. I don't think I knew. Yeah, what love was. No, I really don't think I knew. Um, from the age of like 17 onwards... Um, and women were there for one purpose and one pur purpose alone. That was to give me personal and physical pleasure. Um, and uh, that's very shallow, um, but it goes with uh, history as well. Um, young men need to develop into strong men before they can be kind men, because otherwise they're going to get intimidated, bullied and abused and get isolated. You have to be in the game to be uh, one of the boys. And uh, like it or not, that is the natural way of men. Um, if you're too gentle and too kind and only kind, then it's a very one-sided arrangement and um, somebody's going to come along and just punch you in the nose and you're not going to know what to do and it's going to send you into shock. So I'm very much uh, a believer in um, make yourself a strong person, not a violent person, a strong person. And um, there's, there's some wonderful academic young men who live in safe, cosseted environments, uh, finish their education, go to university, get into politics, get into law, get into medicine. And then the first time in their life they ever experience true uh, unreasonable violence, they go into a state of shock because they've never experienced it before in their life. And as you said, somebody comes up to you and says, what are you looking at? From my world, you knew that that meant there's going to be a fight because there's only one reason he asked you that, because he's figuring out who you are, whether you're a threat, and whether he's going to get away with beating you up. Yeah. And so you go. Mm -hmm. You say, I'm looking at you, and you give it him first. And that's the world of... Um, young men um it's not a great thing it's not necessarily something to be proud of but being a strong confident man requires you to be able to stand up for yourself see when you passed the election did you feel as if you were becoming a man even though you're still only 21 22 oh, did you i thought i was a, i thought i thought 17? no i thought i was a man as soon as i joined the army at 15 i resent the idea of 15 16 year olds we call being called kids um, they're not kids, they're young adults. And I never call 
um, young adults kids because they're not. If you talk to them like kids and you call them kids, they're going to behave like bloody kids. And they're not bloody kids. They're adults. They're responsible and they want to be responsible and they want to be grown ups and they want to be like their mentors. Um, and, you know, we, we have this habit of training our children to remain children and we shouldn't be doing that. We should be training them to be adults. We should be sending them to the shops. We should be trusting them with money. We should be relying on them to do things for themselves. Um, so I don't think that um, there was a stage where I suddenly thought, right, now I've made it, now I'm a man. There was. There's always something else to achieve. There's always something else to do. There's always something else to prove, in my case anyway. Um, and I'm still working hard at that, but... Um, Physically, you know, um, and a, a, a fit young sixteen-year-old should be able to should be able to throw me around the room now. Um, but the difference between me and a sixteen-year-old is that I will fight, and he doesn't know if he will, because mm -hmm. um, it's not whether you can or not. The first stage is whether you whether you will, and once you get past the stage of yes, I will if I have to, um, you know, that's a big step in the right direction. Then it helps to know how. <laughs> yeah. But it's no good knowing how if you won't do it in the first yeah. place, you know. So seeing you're um, in the SCS, what, uh, obviously some things you're not able to touch on, but what can you talk about? Any missions or where you went? Or... Most of them, most of it. Um, if something's secret, then you don't talk about it. What was the first mission you went on? Well, the Iranian, well, no, I, 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 joined, my, I joined my squadron in Northern Ireland um, in December 79. And um, so we did undercover work in Northern Ireland and then returned back to the UK uh, early 1980 and went on the counter-terrorist team. Who was it in Northern Ireland? With um, it wasn't as much fun as being in the Paris. Was it not? Because you're undercover, you're not on the streets, um, you're not a target, um, you're not engaged with the public, you're not taking the abuse, you're not getting stones thrown at you, you're not getting shot at, really. You're dealing with specific uh, information and specific jobs. And although you're at a very high level of risk it um it's not the same it's far more i felt far more scared and um engaged as a young infantryman on the streets of the ardoin the bally murphy and south armagh than i ever did when i had sort of coverage across the whole province in plain clothes yeah you're just there following <laughs> orders doing what you've got to do but how has that seen like the Irish men killing Irish men is that <coughs> it's strange in a way as well that people are in conflict in their own country. Did you see that as well? I've always been an avid reader, and I led I read Leon Uris's Trinity when I was um, eighteen, and I was while I was serving in Northern Ireland. It gave me a, a, a novel that was actually built on historical fact, um, and the historical. The history of Northern Ireland is complicated. Um, it goes back 500 years. Um, the troubles that exist today, even today, uh, go right the way back to the Spanish invasion, Cromwell, Catholic Protestant, um, Elizabeth I, and so on. It goes all the way back to there. So, Battle of the Boyne, um, did Cromwell wipe out cities in Ireland? Well, that seemed to be the standard practice at the time. Um, and people believe the myths of history they don't read it enough um by the time i was i don't know coming up 19 i had enough knowledge about northern ireland to understand an awful lot more about it than just that the ira were the enemy and terrorists i understood that the uda and the unionists and many unionist extremists were also terrorists and an awful lot of the problems that developed in 1969 was a matter of a Republican uh, the Catholic community in Northern Ireland having their civil rights taken away from them. And they were marching for civil rights and the soldiers went there to protect the Catholic community from uh, the Unionist community. So very, very complicated. Um, and um, we went there uh, to keep the peace and um, we prevented a civil war from taking place between those two communities. Um, the numbers that died over the 30 years are minimal compared to somewhere like um, Israel, you know, where they were far, far higher. And those lives were saved by the fact that there were British soldiers on the ground. Yeah, I love the Irish. They've got something in their blood. They're kind of... I've got friends on both <coughs> sides as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not in any... I just... 
I, I can understand both mm. sides of the fight. I get it. It's just a Johnny Adero, and he says if he grew up a mile down the road, he'd be fighting for another cause. Just says in that. But again, people think there's freedom fighters, terrorists, whatever it is. I understand. I don't know. I'm not educated enough to understand the full politics of it. But I can understand why people fight and stand up for what they believe mm -hmm. in because of that community yeah. that in at that time. So see the Iranian <coughs> rescue. How was that? You must have again, young kid. I want to add something about Northern Ireland yeah, of course. Um, because I don't want to give people the impression that I have a one-sided opinion about Northern Ireland. When I went there as a young English soldier, mm -hmm. I knew nothing about the Protestant and Catholic divide of the Troubles or the history. And um, I was quite happy to shoot somebody on behalf of my government. And it didn't make a damn bit of difference to me what side they were on. If they were a baddie with a gun about to shoot me or one of my friends or the member of the public, then I was quite prepared to shoot them. And it made absolutely no difference what their religion was at all. That was standard, really. Yeah, I had a man on today and he says the same thing. He says, I joined the army. <clears throat> because I thought it was the right thing to do for me at that time. So mm. any order I'd done, no matter what it was, I didn't question it. Mm. I was doing a job. Yeah. I can understand that. I've got so many friends from all walks of life, from criminals who've been in the army, who've served in the SES, I've got all over, and I respect every one of them, because that was their life, their decisions at that time. No matter what your politics are or what you agree in life, everybody's raised differently. Everybody sees the world differently. And my grandparents fought in World War II and I loved them to bits. They killed people and I fucking used to love their war stories and three and four. And they used to, I can remember sitting and they used to tell me and I was so, I was thinking, I'm going to join the army. I'm yeah. going to join the yeah. army. And I loved them to bits. Yeah. And they could have been killing whoever. I don't know. But I yeah. just, that's what their life then they made out is I'm protecting this. The bombs used to come over the Clyde side in Glasgow and bombs used to drop with the Germans and, they've done what they could and that's that, that's the beautiful thing there's heroes and whether you agree in it or not there's, there's loads of war heroes I think the um, important thing for if you listen to a lot of veterans the things that they'll tend to emphasise is how many lives they've saved mm -hmm. not how many lives they've taken um, everybody can say oh I was there I shot this person I did that but um, how many lives did you save how many people benefited from the fact that you were a soldier in the Majesty's forces, of course we had um, some we had some pretty appalling people in our units as well, but they were very very strongly disciplined by uh, uh, at all levels, all the way down from the officers right down to the lance corporals on the street. Mm -hmm. So it was very very difficult to do something you shouldn't have done in the first place, and if you did. It was very, very severely investigated. So, you know, you were unlikely to get away with it as well. The military police, the special investigation branch and the RUC didn't turn a blind eye to most of the things that we did. They investigated it. Yeah. Um, so if you if you take the 30 years of Op Banner, which was the operation in Northern Ireland, and the fact that 300,000 British soldiers served there, there were two soldiers convicted of murder and one of... Mans one of um, um, negligent manslaughter in all that time there were soldiers that went to Colchester prison for bad behavior for doing things wrong that they shouldn't have done and um, you know that's that's not known but you think that tiny number uh, of all those people that went there you know did something so severely important that they got convicted of murder and outside of that you know they the um, polit politicians in Northern Ireland and, and politicians at Downing Street as well tend to come out with um, statements such as only 10% of the killings in Northern Ireland were carried out by the state. But of that 10%, almost 100% were in self-defense or a defense of the general public. They weren't killings, whereas 100% of the other 90% that they talk about carried out by terrorists were all murders. You know, it gets lost in the, in the dogma. It really, really does. So the rescue mission, <laughs> you've probably spoke about it hundreds of times, but for my listeners and followers, they're interesting stories. People love these stories because mm. it's it's like fairy tales. Even though you've lived it, you probably think, nah. But it's unbelievable to be doing rescue missions. That everybody always kind of wants to be like a James Bond or some sort of soldier. I remember I used to play with soldiers when I was a kid in tanks and 
I just love the thought of like guns and bombs mm-hmm. and bazookas and all the madness. But you actually lived that when you're going through, like the embassy, the rescue. What's the procedure before that? Well, the procedure when you arrive on the ground is to do an immediate action plan, and the immediate action plan is if it all goes wrong now. Um, you've got this area of responsibility, you've got this area of responsibility, you've got this one, and we go through the doors with sledgehammers and we try to save as many as we possibly can. So we got on the we got on the ground about 48 hours after it started. We were next door in the Royal College of General Practitioners, next door to the Iranian Embassy um, at Prince's Gate uh, in Kensington. And um, nobody knew we were there. We sneaked in about one o'clock in the morning, got all the kit over the wall and in the back door, and there we were. We had an immediate action plan, and there were a ho- there was a whole squadron of us. So a whole squadron is about 60 men, and about 45, 46 of us were assault qualified, which means we were going to do the job. And the rest were uh, attached arms, support arms, and the officers in charge. And we were each given a floor. Each group of eight men was given a floor each. And if it goes wrong, you're going to go into that floor. You're going to go into that floor and make the best of it. And then over the next period of time, you, the officers start to develop a deliberate plan. So they start to gather information on the building, who's being held where, what the doors are made of, are there any uh, security pr- systems we've got to get through is there a basement is there a way through the roof is there a way through the attic can we get listening devices in can we hear what's going on uh, what are the negotiators doing they're establishing a rapport with the terrorists trading people in trading people out um, giving food um, pro- making promises and uh, over the next four days we then developed a deliberate plan and margaret thatcher said the well, there would be no military assault unless they kill somebody and the plan was that, um, you know, we would wear them down and eventually they would give up and they would be arrested and go home. So we prepared, we practiced, uh, we rehearsed, we had different options. And finally, um, they murdered uh, the Charge d'Affaires, a man called Lavazzani, and threw his body out the door on the Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. And, uh, or was it a Monday? I fail to remember. And um, we... I was then given authority to mount an assault, which we had ready and planned. Uh, We left the building silently, and the plan was to sneak up to six entry points, and each eight-man group would take out um, a floor each, and they would plant their charges on their entry points, and the officer in charge would give go, 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 and all those devices would be exploded at the same time. We would enter with speed and surprise and... um, the basic premise was, the basic philosophy was, if you kill the terrorists, you've got more chance of rescuing the hostages. But we were briefed very, very thoroughly on the law. As we were approaching the building, things started to go wrong. One of the guys abseiling down the back of the building to get onto the um, first floor balcony put his foot through a window. And uh, Salim, the terrorist leader, uh, said he'd heard, he was talking to Max Vernon, the hostage negotiator, and said, I've heard... A strange noise I'm going to investigate. At that time, the commanding officer knew that we'd been compromised and gave the go, go, go early. So you see the famous footage on the front balcony of John McAleese and Tom McDonald leaping over and sticking the frame charge on and initiating it when he's only a few feet away from it to blow out the windows. And those eight guys go in there and there's the rescue of Sim Harris and the hostages are behind that window, most of them. Whereas on the back door where this guy's put his foot through the window, <clears throat> he's not only put his foot through the window, he's got his glove caught in his abseil harness. So he's stuck above the window and the other guys abseil past him, throw their pyrotechnics through the window. They go off, set the curtains alight. And now he's becoming a barbecue because the curtains are burning and he can't get down. So he's kicking his way out from the windows, trying to, and he's got, and on top of that, He's managed to get his hand jammed against the pressle switch of his radio. So all communications between everybody have been cut off. And all we can hear down the, all we can hear down the radio is him screaming because he's getting burned alive. And I'm looking up at him and three rounds come through the window above me because the guys have already gone in by now. And I see three bullet holes appear in the window above me. I'm thinking, well, there's nothing I can do about that. There's nothing I can do about this. 
Um, it's too late to lay the charges on the back door. So Big Bob Curry goes in with an eight-pound sledgehammer, takes out the back doors, and in they go. It's my job to stand on the back door with Ginge and go to any place where there's an emergency. So we're holding the back door. There's screaming, there's noise, there's gas. Above me, Tommy Palmer is um, has come back out the window underneath the guy who's burning because his head's caught fire. So he takes his gas mask off, throws it away, puts the flames out on his own head, and then goes back into the gas and does his job and kills two terrorists without his gas mask on. Meanwhile, above Tom, who's hanging on the uh, rope, the guys are trying to cut him down, but it's a, it's a rope under tension. He's kicking himself out. If they cut the rope when he's kicking outwards, he's going to drop 30 feet onto solid concrete. So they have to cut it. And they, they eventually cut it and he drops down onto the balcony and goes in and carries on with his job with severely burned legs. I'm on the ground floor. As he drops, the pressle switch comes clear. The radio station's open. Hector, not knowing the commanding officer, not knowing what the hell's going on, uh, suddenly goes, reserves go in. So me and Jins go through the door in the back door into the, into the foyer and Trevor Locke is coming clear at the bottom of the stairs. He's the policeman that's been held hostage. So grab him, throw him out to the next guy on the door. Then the hostages start to come down and we're just throwing them down, mostly females. Boom, 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 boom. And they're scared to death. So we're just keeping them scared and we're passing them out like a rugby ball. Bang, bang, bang. Out they go. There's a chain. Things are organized. You know, there's screaming, there's smoke, there's fire, there's, there's, there's gunfire, but it's organized. And out they go, out they go, out they go. And then up above on the stairway, just above me, somebody shouts, um, I, hiss, I see somebody out the corner of my eye get butt swiped. And somebody shouts, he's a terrorist. And as this guy comes clear at the bottom of the stairs, there's, a, there's one of our troops standing within a few feet of him, very, very close to him, who opens fire. And I open fire as well. And I fire three rounds. And this guy puts 24 rounds in him from about 12 inches. And the guy crumples to the floor. And he's got a grenade in his hand. And um, that grenade uh, doesn't have the pin pulled out. And so, you know, he crumples into a pile at the bottom of the stairs. And then the rest of the hostages are out, out, out. And uh, we get them out on the grass outside. And we handcuff everybody with plastic cuffs. And one of the terrorists has managed to um, hide himself in amongst the hostages. And outside, uh, the hostages quickly identify him. And uh, me and a guy called Tony pick him up and carry him away from the others and separate him. And, um, you know, that's pretty much the operation over in seven minutes. And we killed five terrorists, captured one and rescued 19 hostages. One hostage was killed by the terrorists as we made our entry. Um, it, nobody had heard of the SAS before that. Um, we were Fred Carnot's army in darkest Herefordshire. And um, after that, um, we became the myth that still exists today. <laughs> What's that feeling like doing something like that? Annoying. Is that? Why? You mean the myth? The myth's no, annoying. The, the feeling of um, something like that. Sense can, of um, can through doors and people can kill you. The adrenaline, you, you, I'd imagine you can't buy that anywhere. Like, well, what's no, you, that feeling? You train with fear. You train on the edge of fear. You know, so let me give you an example. If, you, if you're a Formula One racing driver and you drive around corners at 200 kilometers per hour and understand the aerodynamics of the vehicle and it can do this, and then you or me get into that vehicle, it's just scare us to death because we're not familiar with it. Special Forces soldiers are trained on the edge of danger all the time so that when the real thing happens, it's almost like an exercise. You're prepared. Your heartbeat isn't going through the roof. You can make minor cognitive decisions. You can change according to the circumstances. You can think clearly under pressure. And you're extraordinarily fit, so that keeps your heartbeat down. There's a, a famous writer called Malcolm Gladwell who wrote Tipping Point and Blink, and um, he did an investigation into why police officers with guns kill the wrong people sometimes. And he said it's because um, they're not, once the heartbeat goes above 145 beats a minute, you can't make minor, cogn minor cognitive decisions. So you get there, somebody sent you down into the London Underground, and you've got to chase a guy and you've got a full description of him. By the time you get there, all you can see is all that's going through your brain is he's got dark skin, he's got curly hair, and he's got a bomb. Kill him. 
you know, nothing else matters. And so you're going to make mistakes. We were extraordinarily fit, extraordinarily well-trained, and we were capable of dealing with fear. And consequently, we made, we made the errors right during that operation. And we felt that we'd done a highly professional, successful job. And that was where our, our pride ended. And we moved on and we got back to Hereford that night, ready to do another one, should it be required the next day. Did you just get medals for that? The, it was, the medals were a bit of a farce because the government turned around and said, here, you can have these, there's five, give them to who you want. And um, Why that not may... everyone get one? Is that not a slap in the face? <clears throat> well, first, we didn't expect medals because we, up to that point in time, we weren't allowed to accept them because medals are listed especially Valor Medals. Mm -hmm. And so it would have identified members of the Special Air Service. So we didn't get medals. Um, but they, they said, okay, you can have these. And so the, the regiment had to decide who got them. And that created an awful lot of uh, animosity and bad feeling, unfortunately, because, as you say, it would have been far better just to give everybody a unit citation mm -hmm. or a certificate or a little flash you could put on your uniform forevermore and say, I was that man. Yeah. <laughs> I but was on that balcony. <laughs> why did they take the embassy hostage? What was their plans? Um, they were trained by Iraq, by Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Um, they were Rabistanis who um, a lot of uh, uh, Arab, Arabic, Arabic people in Iran were being arrested under the Islamic Re Revolution and being imprisoned unfairly. And these young men wanted to draw attention to their cause. And they were stitched up by Iraqi secret intelligence to go into London in the belief that if they did this, that uh, the Iraqi diplomats would get them out and have them released. And it'd all be over in a couple of days, but it would draw attention to their cause. And um, it didn't work out that way. Yeah, it was never going to work out that way. If they no. believed that, they deserved to be dead. They were young. Yeah. You know, they... they they were made to feel special. Um, most that, young terrorists are made to feel important. Is that brainwashing? Brainwashing? Um, Grooming kind yeah, of? Yeah, I, I don't, so I'm not sure where you go from persuasion to brainwashing. Yeah. Um, if you find people that are emotionally motivated and feed that, then you don't really need to brainwash them. You just say, yeah, you're right. Yeah, great. Yeah, we we can help you with that. Yeah, this is what you should do. Um, strap this on. Go and get on a red bus in London. You know, and your 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 people will revere you forevermore, and you'll go to heaven forever. You know, um, you're starting with the with the ingredient with the recipe. You're just making the cake. Yeah. You don't need to brainwash them. Did you? What was the suicide <clears throat> mission you were on? Ha, that was um, we were. This was in the Falklands War, 1982, and B Squadron were. Um, were um, told that we were going to go into Argentina. We were going to land on the runways where the super attendard jets were flying from. These jets were firing X set missiles that were sinking our capital ships. And there was a danger of us losing the war down there because of that. So our squadron was going to land in two C-130 Hercules aircraft. We were going to destroy the jets on the runway and we were going to then get killed or captured because there was no way home. There was no fuel to come back. Um, my wife, Heather, was eight months pregnant. Um, I remember leaving the door with her and uh, telling her what, how I, what name I wanted to give our son when he was born. I knew the mission. She obviously didn't. And um, we got on the plane, and we left to carry out the mission, and we got as far as Ascension Islands, and it was delayed, and it was delayed, and then eventually it was cancelled. And um, half of us got down to the Falklands just before the surrender. I often say, you know, when half of B Squadron, the famous B Squadron from the Iranian embassy arrived in the Falklands, the Argentinians heard about it and surrendered. Yeah. <laughs> How is it for a soldier when you've got the family life then, you've got the missus who you love, the babies on the way and the kids? How hard is it to then go on these sort of missions knowing that you could die anytime you leave the house? You have to separate it. How do you do that? Is that just um, training with? This is my job. This is my cat badge. I've worn it. Um, I've had the glory for seven minutes in London. Now you're going to see if you're really worth it. And um, the second I left the house and got in the car with the duty driver, that was, in, that, was, that was over. Now this is what I had to do. 
and um, until the mission was properly delayed. I mean, although I had the opportunity on Ascension Island to phone Heather, the mission was still on um, and it was going to happen and we were going to do it. And um, we had very, very good leadership at that time. So negativity wasn't going to come into the frame. This was the mission. This was what you got trained for. This was why you wore the cat badge. You're going to do the job. And if you survive, that's a bonus. When were you at your most tested? When did you think, I've fucked it here? Were you ever at that moment where you thought, this is the moment I'm not going to be here anymore? Or was was Um, it always like that? Not when I was in the British Army. Um, When I was in the Mozambican Army, um, there was a moment that's difficult to talk about. Um... Because it took me a long, long time to write about it. And um, my wife said, and it it was 20 years later that I wrote Fighting Scared. And my wife read it for the first time. And she said, oh, shit, now I know why you were as you were when you came back. Um, And I put myself into a very, very, very dangerous situation out of bravado as much as anything else, in a very, very, very dangerous war. And afterwards I thought to myself, what would I have to kill somebody? And afterwards I thought, I didn't need to be there. I didn't need to do that. What would Heather have said about this? Um, I came back with some huge anger management issues afterwards for a while. And um, my marriage suffered, um, but we put it back together. Um, but it was, um, you know, that, that 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 was probably the time where um, I thought, I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man right now. And, um, yeah, it was very traumatic. How is it killing someone? Um, not difficult. Um, providing the circumstances are justified. So the people at the Iranian embassy, they were the bad guys. We were the good guys. We were rescuing people, saving lives. Fine. Northern Ireland, they were the bad guys. It's when you get the wrong guys by mistake. That's very, very difficult. Or when you see people die um, as collateral damage in a war that you're involved with, um, that's difficult as well. You know, I'm not talking about soldiers. I'm talking about women and children um, who have just been murdered or cut to pieces for no justifiable reason other than the fact that the enemy just decided to do it. Um uh, you don't have to understand why they do it. You just have to understand how to deal with it. Um, so they're, they're difficult. But you imagine if there's, there's guys that talk about, um, oh, after the Second World War, my grandfather never spoke about it. And the chances are he never spoke about it because there's some things he wasn't proud of. There were some things he was engaged in out of necessity that caused the deaths of innocent people. And so, no, why would you want to pick over those old scabs over and over again? Let it go. It's in the past. Um, I had to uh, learn to let certain things go and put them in the past as well. Yeah. Mm. I interviewed a sniper. Amazing, man. Amazing. Very damaged here, though. He knows this. He speaks about it. But he, I think it was like eight, eight people with a sniper, the world's longest sniper kill Craig. But he had to make decisions when there was women and children walking towards him. They didn't know if there were suicide bombers they made the correct decision. They were suicide bombers, but there was another man, I think he was a Navy SEAL. He had the decision or they were trying to stop the women and the women and daughter from coming, but they had the signs, but they couldn't read English hmm. and they had to make that decision and take their life and they got the decision wrong. Yeah. They just couldn't read English or something, but you see the pain in their eyes, but again, they're there to do a job and that's the destruction of wars and all that, but somebody needs to do it where it's just that decision, that, being in that but position yeah you're in a dilemma there's no right um you just have to make you choose between the devil and the deep blue sea and um sometimes you get it wrong um i'm fortunate that i um i've never never been personally responsible for the death of an innocent um and so that's easier to live with do you see people struggle when they do so there are some people that genuinely struggle there are some people that recover there are people that there are a small number of people that can't cope and uh, need an awful lot of help. And then there's another group 
who actually feed on the fact of, you know, I've got this problem and I'm a hero and uh, I want to be damaged and I want to tell you I've got PTSD and I want you to think that I'm a I'm a, a superman that's lived in some terribly dangerous places and um, it's lovely that, you know, I get paid benefits for feeling this way. Yeah. I've, it's the SAS ones. <coughs> I'm going to be honest, he's a fucking tapped. He's a mad. I interviewed old Peter McAleese. Oh, yeah, I'm a Peter. He's yeah. fucking crazy. He's sitting in the old folks' home just telling all his old mm. stories. And I say to him, how do you feel? He says, I don't give a fuck. Mm. And I'm thinking, he never did. Good on you, Peter. Like, mm. I, because... Depression's there, listen, PTSD, everybody's got different levels of depression. But genuinely, the ones I think it don't give a fuck, it doesn't affect. Maybe it's an act, maybe it is, but it gets them through whatever they're going through. I think um, in the modern world, we've been picking the wrong type of people to become soldiers. If you want good soldiers, you need naughty boys. You need, in my period, it was the kids off the back streets of Leeds and Glasgow and Edinburgh and Lee and Belfast and, you know, the boys that weren't going anywhere at school but had a, something about them. And uh, you made you made good, competent fighting soldiers out of them. Um, if you pick the nice kids to be in the army, then you shouldn't be surprised that they struggle to cope with the adversity that they come across because they haven't had adversity in their life to begin with. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm very much for um, having so having an increase in the numbers of soldiers in the British Army and making it available to troubled, difficult, tough, young people, predominantly men, because men make better soldiers than women do. Because, And if you want any evidence of that, put the England male rugby team up against the England female rugby team and see what the result is. You know, nothing against women being soldiers, but men make better soldiers than women on average. Yeah, you've got to be honest here. If there's a war, it's men. Any catastrophe, it's men you want at the forefront. Well, they're more aggressive and they're bigger and stronger. Of course. It's, it's a fact. It's science. It's they can carry more weight. It's common knowledge. Mm. It's Listen, if a woman's strong and fat and she can keep up with the men, then she deserves well, there a, are she exceptional women. Place. Yeah, of course. But, but they're rare. Yeah, that's what I'm just saying. Men are the strongest and even... Uh, Serena Williams, I think, says that, or Venus Williams, she was <coughs> saying, are you going to play Andy Murray? And she said, it's only tennis. And she says, of course not. He's <laughs> faster, he's sharper, he's quicker. Yeah. He says, it would beat me 6-0, 6-0, 6-0. He says, she was, I'm not going to embarrass myself. But like you say, there is exception, exceptions where somebody <laughs> shows up and they've got that and there's something to prove I'm better than you. But if I even think the USA football team <coughs> played an under, or a, a under 15s or under 16s team and they beat them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And yeah. It's all this equal pay and that. And listen, you can go down all that politics route, but the, as for the football side of things in the pay world. Come, pay comes from the public. Yeah, of course. Pay the comes Cup, from the media. Yeah, with so, 6 billion, 7 billion the World Cup generated for men. Mm -hmm. For the women, it only generated 130, 150. Yeah. So it's on. viewing figures that yeah, you know yeah. wages. It's, yeah. Not gender. Yeah. It's viewing figures. But when if, I you, ask, if, yeah. you, if you go, you make, a, you make a fantastic podcast and you get a million people looking at you. Then you're going to get far more money than if I make one and fifty thousand do it. Yeah, you know, it's of course. it's not getting nothing to do with whether sense. I'm what my yeah. d orientation is. You know, it doesn't yeah. make any difference. What makes a good soldier? <clears throat> um, what makes a good soldier? Wow, that's a that's a big big question. Um, leaders make good soldiers, so it's having um, a history and a cadre and a system that perpetuates through the years and traditions and expectations. Um, because you can take a dog and you can train it to do anything. And you can take a young man and you can train most of them to be soldiers. Not all of them, but most of them to be soldiers of a reasonable quality. But you have to have that cadre, that history, that, that group of people that know what they want to get out of these young men, that can break them down and rebuild them into something that's going to um, be creditable in that particular world. Do you think leaders are born or do you think they can be created? No, I don't think leaders can be created. I think that there's something in some people that generates, um, maybe you could call it charisma. I mean, you can, you can create managers, don't get me wrong, you can create sergeants and staff sergeants and sergeant majors and officers, and you can teach them how to manage men. That's fine. But leading men 
is very, very different from managing them. Leading, you lead people with inspiration. You inspire people with your example. I call it ICE. Inspiration, example, and courage. Inspiration, courage, and example. I can spell too. (laughs) Inspiration, courage, and example. ICE. Mm -hmm. And if you inspire people and you've got the courage to lead them and take chances and set that damn good example, then that's a very good place to begin if you want to actually see a see an experience a leader. I think uh, Volodymyr Zelensky is a classic example of that. You know, um, he's led his people from the front, from the very darkest days at the beginning of the Ukraine war. Um, he's taken the risks. He's been in the front line. He's worn the uniform, refused to run away. Um, he's always there. He's always with, with his men. Um, and I, I think right now in the, in the contemporary world, if somebody wanted an example of what it is to be a true leader, you don't have to look any further than him. You talk about frequently about Russia and Ukraine war. Like, how does that, how does it these wars come about, especially in this day and age? Obviously, I don't know too much about it, but I know when wars happen in other countries, it affect, affects things here. Look at the pricing on fuel and mm-hmm. everything's r- risen here. How do you, how does these things still happen in twenty twenty three, Russia and Ukraine? And if it could kick off, listen, you're, Russia are a powerful country. We know this as one hundred and forty million, and and Putin's a fucking nutcase. So. How does it, do you see things like that with Ukraine before it happens, yeah. with the politics and how yeah, I, get, I, I was warning, um, the reason I started my um, almost daily blog on LinkedIn is because first, I wanted to write. Secondly, I didn't want to be accused of having a vested interest on behalf of somebody. There's no monetization on LinkedIn. And um, thirdly, I wanted to engage people that could actually read and think and and, and engage with the conversation rather than just, you know, sound bites. So um, I started to write about it before Russia um, invaded. And I was frustrated because everybody in Britain was talking about Boris's bloody tea party. Everyone in Australia was talking about Djokovic getting, you know, kicked out of the country for not having the right visa. Everybody in America was talking about number 45, the orange monster, and um, nobody was talking about 100,000 people, 100,000 soldiers uh, concentrating on the border of Ukraine. I was screaming, you know, they are going to invade. And all the really wise people in government in Europe were going, no, no, they wouldn't do that. We buy too much of their oil and gas. You know, no, no, it's not in their best interest. What was in their interest? The fact that we'd become weak. NATO had become weak. We were weak. We had got fat. We had got flabby. We reduced our spending on um, defence. Um, nobody in our government was a former soldier. Nobody in our governments had experienced war anymore. And they believed the lies that Vladimir Putin and his government were telling them. And they knew nothing about the um, psychology and the mentality of bullies And we'd become weak. And as soon as you become weak, people start to push. And Putin believed, with Donald Trump's help, he could walk straight into Ukraine and mount a military coup and nobody would do a damn thing. And he was right, except he didn't take the Ukrainians and Volodymyr Zelensky into the equation. And they fought. And that was where he got it wrong. What about if Russia and China, and China came together? Could they take over the world? Or is that too, too far-fetched? Russia and China will never come together. China does what's right for China. Mm-hmm. Um, Why do people <clears throat> say that then? Russia well, because, because the media love to frighten us. I mean, you, you look at MSN, MSM every, every single day. Mm-hmm. The whole front page is full of stories designed... To frighten you, Fearmonger. will they have a new? Will they mount a nuclear attack? Will they do this? It has been alleged. You know, what if the worst and most terrible thing happens? Well, what's the alternative? The alternative is let Vladimir Putin take over the world. Is it because we're too scared to stand up to him? No, we have to be strong now because we weren't strong before. We have to be stronger now because we weren't strong before. Our, the British Army is now regular army is sixty eight thousand men. Now, that's 68,000 all arms, okay? That means armor, artillery, and infantry probably 
total less than 30,000. 30,000 men who are capable of actually being the point of the spear. They're not, that's not enough to defend Dover. And that's where we are. When I joined the army, there was 160,000 men in the British army alone. And the Air Force and the Navy are the same. You know, we got weak. And because we got weak, autocrats, tyrants, dictator, dictators start to push. And if you're not strong enough to stand up to them, it's your own bloody fault. Is Britain a target potentially to get invaded? <clears throat> no, it's not a target to be invaded. Um, Putin got it wrong. He thought he was going to do another Czechoslovakia on Ukraine. He thought he was going to walk in, replace Zelensky's government, uh, have a put, put a puppet government in charge, and that was going to be the end of it. Marching with your tanks, everybody's scared, nobody will do anything, we've got too much oil to sell, and that'll be the end of it. They got it wrong. Um, now he's got to find a way out. I mean, the latest figures, the latest conservative figures say that over 250,000 Russian soldiers have been killed so far. They're running out of money. Their wealth fund is 30% of what it was two years ago. They're running out of material. You know, it's, they're, they're buying ammunition off of North Korea. The only friends they've got left in the world are North Korea and Iran because China's not really their friend. China's just saying, well, what can we get out of this at the moment that's convenient to us? And um, now they're stepping away from it. And other people are stepping away from it, including Viktor Orban in Hungary, because now he knows, and, and uh, Erdogan in Turkey, because they can see who's going to win. And it's Ukraine that's going to win. Do you think so? What about when Putin is saying it's because NATO was becoming closer? How true, true is that? Say again? When Putin says NATO was becoming closer to Russia and they told them to stay back, is that... It, it wasn't NATO that... Um, NATO's always been a defensive organisation. It wasn't NATO that um, Putin was scared of. It was democracy and free and open elections. It was the ideology of Western democracy that was a threat to Putin, not NATO. Um, Where does that... I, I'll, I'll get my information sometimes from what I see online or whatever but that's what ad says that putin went mad because nato was coming closer to russia than they should that's just uh, that's just his political excuse to uh, invade ukraine um putin's not mad putin is a manipulative devious uh, product of the kgb and the fsb would you um, like some someone like putin to run the uk oh my god no is, he a, is he a strong character though like, oh God, yeah, he's, he's he, like a fifth Dan or sixth Dan in martial arts as well. well he's a lot of shit. Uh, judo, but he says, um, but who cares? Um, <laughs> you know, um, you know. He's, uh, so what? I mean, he's 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 a strong dictator in an, in an autocratic society, yeah. where you know he controls the police and the army, so he can he can do pretty much as he pleases. How much is he worth? <clears throat> uh, phenomenal amount. Someone says he owned Bitcoin. I don't know how true that is. But. Uh, yeah, I mean, but the thing is, um, he can't spend it now, can he? Yeah, um, it's no good having money if no if you if nobody will sell you anything. What about the Americans? How are they strong? Are they weak at the moment? The Americans are the the strongest military power in the world and still are. Um, and they're still good friends with Britain. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're, they're a Western democracy, and um, the most dangerous thing in America is uh, MAGA. MAGA is the most dangerous thing to Western democracy that's ever existed since the Second World War. Um, they're right-wing extremists. Most of them have been incorporated from the Ku Klux Klan. They're dangerous, and their leader's extremely dangerous. And there's, um, you know, anybody that can't see that they tried to create an American dictatorship by overthrowing their own government isn't looking at the real world. You know, it's wrong. And so, you know... Um, that's that's the problem that America have got to deal with, and they are dealing with it fairly successfully. But it goes back to, as you did, you showed me the telephone, the screen, social media, and people not thinking, not reading, not believing, and being kept in their ignorance and then having the right to vote. You've got to give everybody the information and teach them what they're voting for. Um, you want to vote so you can carry a gun. You want to vote so you can have an assault rifle. You've got organ, um, what is it? I mean, fascism is actually the incorporation of, um, is the amalgamation of corporations with the government. That's what fascism actually is. It's not necessarily Nazis. It's, it's corporations and government controlling everything that happens, controlling the media, controlling people, controlling money, controlling the decisions made in politics. And 
there's a huge danger very much in America, but also in Great Britain, in Britain today, that that's the case, that our government's being controlled by vested interests and huge money makers, and, um, you know, it's it's at risk. Could there uh, be a World War Three? There could always be a war. There'll always be another war. Because whether there's over 20, 30 wars in the world just Think now. about starting a war if you're a, the leader of a, a huge nation uh, with nuclear weapons, for example. It's not what you've got to gain, it's what you've got to lose. Mm-hmm. And no, I mean, the perfect, the thing about nuclear weapons is they're a deterrent. The second you lose them, they've lost their deterrent value and you're going to get crushed no matter what you do. Mutually mm-hmm. assured destruction. So there's nothing in nuclear weapons except the threat of using them. You know, um, Putin blew the Zaporizhia Dam. Now it's no longer a threat. It's been done. It's no longer a risk, is it? Mm. It's uh, everybody, everyone in the media was, oh my God, what if they do it? Well, they did it and we're still here and the war's still going on and the floods have gone. And now, yesterday, the Ukrainians crossed the river, the, the, the Dnipro River and built another bridgehead across the water. So, you know, um, media, especially, the media have to produce something every day, and they do what's called clickbait. So they frighten you. They get you. You know, There's always something up about the weather. Oh, there's going to be terrible snow in England. You know, you click on that. What was this about snow? Well, of course, there's not. It's going to get you to click. It's advertising. They're selling product. And if everybody's selling product, where are you going to find the truth? You're not damn well going to find it on national news media outlets anymore. Do you think there will ever be peace in the world? There seems to be a lot of destruction everywhere just by certain men. Do you think there would ever be peace all around the world? Or is that too far-fetched? Well, I think it's part of human nature to to um, Fight? challenge one another, to vie for resources. Um, even chimpanzees do it. And, you know, it's part of our nature to... if if. Somebody's weak, you push. Only civilized and trained people don't do that. They start to think, well, this is wrong. But the majority of people go, oh, nobody's looking. Can I steal it? Um, can I take it from them? What can they do if I do it back? You know, what's, why do most people obey the law? Because they're frightened of the consequences. Yeah. If there are no consequences, then there's no law. Because I know you're a like, war expert. I know you do a lot of reading and stuff. How close was Hitler from taking over the world was that ever a possibility or did, was it just always destined to fail no he was um he, he, there was a danger of him taking over the whole of europe but um he miscalculated when it came to Russia. Uh, invading no before that he miscalculated when it came to invading britain and so they needed air superiority to take over britain and goering had promised it to him and uh, he failed to achieve that so when he turned around and went back to his main mission, which was to destroy communism um, and invade Russia, he left Britain behind him on the back door, ready to create a second front. And then he declared war on America when the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. He didn't have to, but he had this agreement, the tripartite agreement with Italy and um, with Japan. And he declared war on America. So Hitler brought America into the war. But he thought that America would concentrate on the Pacific, which was their main area of influence. And it didn't work out that way. Is that Pedro Harbor? Well, the main American, American is, you know, divided by the Pacific and the Atlantic. Mm-hmm. And they thought because they had Hawaii and they had the Philippines that they would um, concentrate their armed forces over in that part of the world against Japan. Well, they put, they put Germany first, I think, with an awful lot of persuasion from Winston Churchill. And uh, all of a sudden, he's got a second front building behind him while he's trying to uh, invade Russia. Uh, the American, the huge American economic machi- machine starts to produce weapons at a at phenomenal rate uh, and starts to supply them to Russia as well as to the UK. And... Um, and all of a sudden, Hitler's being hit on two fronts. And although his soldiers were phenomenal, and his, um, the Russians just simply swamped him with men and materiel. And then um, I like to think that um, uh, the Russians saved us from the Germans and the Americans saved us from the Russians. <laughs> How big was Churchill's role in winning World War II? Enormous. Uh, Churchill's role was enormous because he refused to... Um, negotiate peace with Hitler 
and um, against the advice of Lord Halifax. And um, he said, you know, we will fight them on the beaches. And um, he gave, he, he made the resolve that would do that. And Britain was still, you know, a great naval power too at that time. So it had an awful lot of strength that didn't exist on the land. Didn't have a, Again, they'd reduced their army to such a small level that it wasn't a great deal of help when it went to help the French um, because we were too small. And we're, we only had 250,000 then. Well, now we've only got 68,000, you know, crazy, so we're, yeah. you know, a hollow force. Yeah. And that's sad. And not only sad because of the lack of defense, but the military was a skills engine. It produced engineers, plumbers, medics, leaders, managers, accountants, paymasters, cooks. It created all these skills for the civilian world when those guys left, and that's no longer there either. Yeah. What did you do after the SAS? Oh, my goodness, there loads of things. I mean, my military life was, my British military life was 12 years long. I left the SAS. I was a bodyguard. I was a mercenary. Um, I was in Lebanon. I was in Sri Lanka. I was a bodyguard to the Prime Minister of Lebanon um, while he was making a run for the Prime Ministership. Um, I started a small security company in London. I learned a lot about business, how to lose money. <laughs> nah. um, I learned how to write letters, how to negotiate, how to keep accounts, how to um, do all sorts of things. But finally, I ended up teaching kids martial arts. Um, and uh, I did that for 25 years um, in southwest London. I had over a 1,000 kids between the age of 4 and 15 and about 50 adults as well. And my son, Alex, runs that organization now. Um, it's called London Karate Limited. And uh, I broke my neck when I was 54, training with my son, doing karate with my son. It's not as exciting as it sounds. But um, I um, couldn't do martial arts anymore. So um, a couple of years later, I went to uni as a 56-year-old undergrad um, to do English Lit with creative writing and graduated when I was 59. And the first thing I learned was that nobody wants to sit next to their grandpa at school. And 95% uh, of my course were young females, which was an absolute nightmare. And the uh, English faculty at Surrey was at that time dominated by radical feminists who pigeonholed me into being a, um, um, a right-wing skinhead who you know, um, would have been homophobic <laughs> and they knew absolutely nothing about me at all. And it took them two years to figure out that I was essentially the opposite. Um, but I enjoyed it. I learned a lot from it. And um, I'd written Fighting Scared before that and I've written four books since I left. How the fuck did you break your back? My neck, yeah. I was, um, I was hitting an impact pad and talking to the class at the same time. And I whipped my body into the punch and I hit the pad, but my, I was still looking at the class and so my neck was in the wrong position. And I, uh, I fractured, uh, I think it was C5 up here, um, just with a torque injury, so it's that. Could that be wear and tear just through the years where it's been a little bit weaker than the yeah, average I think, man? Well, no, I think, I, think, I think partly the punches are taken to the head. <laughs> but um, I think predominantly um, when you practice a technique for 20, 30 years, you know, the technique is so refined and strong that you're putting maybe one and a half tons of power and impact kinetic energy into those two knuckles there. And the bones have aged. So they, they contribute. And because my neck wasn't in the right position looking at the target, instead it was looking at the class as I hit it, um, there was a weakness there and um, that power had to be released somewhere. And um, it's, it's, it's applied physics, really. You bodyguard for Al-Fayed, is that correct? Yeah, for the first 15 months out of the army. Um, it was more Al-Fayed's security team rather than bodyguarding. Um, it was prestige bodyguarding. There wasn't really a threat to his life. Um, but I did look after Dodie occasionally when he came to London. And again, it was that man over there is my bodyguard you know we were the same age he used to go to harry's bar and sit in the corner with a glass of perrier and watch him with ku stark and michelle pfeiffer and people like that you know um after 15 months it was good money but i was bored <laughs> do you miss it miss what 
the fucking madness, the thrill of the shootings and the bombs and the going through windows and is there an element of no? Or do you feel as if oof, I'm just no, tired of it now? I'm I happy. wasn't. I wasn't tired of it. I just always moving on to the next thing. I love that about you, where you've never just stopped. You've always done something. What's it like when you do? You ever just sit yourself and just gather your thoughts, or is it just too wild up there? You need to keep busy. Well, my neck screwed up. Um, I had cancer five years ago and had my bladder removed. Um, so I um, physically I. Um, I'm quite weak, you know, some days I can walk three or four miles and other days I can't walk up the stairs. Today's a good day. Yes. Um, That's because you're coming to meet me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so what can you do? Um, I have to watch my weight cause I can't exercise. So I have quite a strict dietary regime. What can I do? I can speak and I can write. I do corporate speaking. I write every day. Uh, the more I write, the better I get at it. Um, I'm halfway through a novel that I want to finish because it's a dark who done it. Um, I'm putting together a collation of my blogs on Ukraine going back 16 months, 18 months now. And there's a hundred thousand words on the paper and you can see where I was right and where I was wrong. And I would say 80% right. And I want to put that out when this conflict starts to come to a conclusion um, I, um, met, uh, the new commissioner for the legacy agreement in, um, Whitehall today, um, talking about the, um, new, uh, investigation process to create rest, to create reconciliation in Northern Ireland. And so I'm considering applying to be a non-executive commissioner on that to how, give the veterans a voice, um, at the table. Um, I've been at it for eight years. Me and not I mean, not me alone, but me and about half a dozen other really really good people, um, and um, so yeah, I've got lots and lots to do still. I love that that you've never gave up though. You broke your neck. You've got the bag in as well. Were you drinking? I um, when I was a young soldier, they used to call me Two Pint Bob because two pints and I was pissed. Mm -hmm. um, I realised at the age of nineteen that after I had that serious beating that I would always have an advantage in a fight if I wasn't drinking. So um, I've always been a fight, quite a mild drinker, but now I can't touch alcohol at all because um, since I had the operation, if I had half a pint of lager now, I'd have a pounding headache within half an hour and my eyes would go bloodshot. Um, so I don't touch alcohol at all. I don't miss it. Um, I enjoy myself with people regardless of that. But uh, as the evening goes on, you find yourself being left out of the conversation yeah. <laughs> because it's too mad and insane yeah. and you're not there um but um i've got nothing against people drinking alcohol within reason um but um i don't what's the saddest moment of being a soldier losing close friends um i had uh, i've lost a lot of friends over the years um some to conflict one very very close one because his parachute didn't open when he was day after his eight nineteenth birthday. Um, others because they committed suicide for various different reasons. I don't think they were down to their military service. I think they were down to their circumstances in life. One because he was a paranoid schizophrenic, who I loved intensely. Um, you know, um, life shit sometimes, and um, you know. You can't spend your whole life being happy. You've got to have the shit bits in order to in order to appreciate the good bits. And uh, you know we're all we're all going to uh, die one day, and hopefully we can get as much out of it as we can. Um, I like the American T-shirt. Shit happens, and I like never let the bastards get you down. Yeah. <laughs> What's your happiest moment being a soldier? Oh, being a soldier, that's different. Um, I think one of my happiest moments was getting into the special air service. One of my other happiest moments was getting into uh, the parachute regiment because they were huge moments of achievement, but they don't compare at all to the happiness of having, having my children born to growing up with them, to going up the mountains, camping with them, to teaching them to swim, to dealing with their problems, to seeing them having children. Um, you know, those are the real joys in life. What's that mercenary? I was a mercenary in in uh, Sri Lanka and Lebanon and Mozambique. What is that you do there? Basically, you're a contract soldier. 
most of the time you go there to um, to train foreign troops rather than to actually be engaged in combat. But once you're there, especially in Mozambique, you the combat came to you. Sri Lanka, it came to us as well. In Sri Lanka, I realised I was fighting for the wrong side after three months, and so I resigned. A terrible genocide committed by the Sinhalese people against the Tamils, and um, I was powerless to do more than resign and go home. Um, Mozambique, I was definitely on the right side. I was a major in Frelimo, and um, I fought for them for 15 months um, and saw an awful lot, or I saw more combat in Mozambique than I saw in all my military career combined up to that point. Um, so that was very different. No air support, no heavy artillery, a pure infantry war against uh, an extremely desperate and violent enemy. So, yeah. Do you feel as if there should be more support for people in the military? I do a lot of homeless work in Glasgow and the majority of ex-soldiers on the streets, it's hard to see, but do you feel as if there should be enough things in place or do you feel as if there is things in place? I don't know if there's enough. I do know there's more support now than there's ever been in the past. There's more available and there's more people trying to do things and there are... Um, you know, a lot of charities and support structures there. There are some people you can you can only manage, you can't fix. Um, I think that the homeless problems of the former soldiers are the same problems that exist in the general population. Homelessness should be dealt with in this country in general, not just for one group as a special group. Um, and we could do it. The Finns have done it. They got a home, ho, um, homes first policy where everybody gets housed and then they deal with the social problems. What we do is we, we make um, criteria for people to get housing and so they stay on the street. And when they stay on the street, they get sick, they commit crime, they die, they fester in their own problems and they get when things get worse. Um, we've taken away an awful lot of our social systems um, and our civic systems in this country. Um, they're being taken away for vested interest, for money. Socialism has a great deal of value if it's, if it's balanced. Uh, they took away council housing. They took away social housing and called it affordable housing. If you've got nothing, how can anything be affordable? That's a ridiculous process to go through. Um, there's so many things that I get frustrated and annoyed about. Um, I was the leader of the Veterans and People's Party for a, a period of time, but I got too sick to carry on. Um, so, um, so many things wrong in this country. So I write about it. I write about it. Um, I try to get engaged with it, but I'm getting old and I'm getting sick. And there's only so many battles you can fight at the same time. I wish more people would speak up. I really do. How was it writing your first book? Well, I wrote my first book before I'd had any training. It took me six years to write it. And uh, I wrote the first few chapters and Heather, my wife, uh, picked up and she looked at the first few chapters and she came back to me and said, this is shit. <laughs> and uh, I said, why, why, what's wrong? You know, so she said, it's like a report, like a military report. It's like a memorandum. You know, people don't want to read that. She said, you know, what did the room look like when you left home? You know, what was your mother doing? How did you feel? And so then I sat down and started writing Fighting Scared and she edited it and she helped me bring that part of me out. And there were times when I can I was writing stuff and crying on the paper um, because all those pent-up emotions were in there, all that frustration and sadness and loss. Um, it was there and I put it into the story and it came out. Um, as it should have come out, you know, because people don't want to read facts and figures and reports. They want to read about your, how you felt, you know, why did you screw up? Not just, you know, gas and bash them and smash them, but, um, you know, what was, what, what did you struggle with? Um, how did you genuinely feel? Were you scared? And honestly, how did you deal with that? You know, were you, are you a real person or just some mythological figure with a cat badge on your head? You know, mm -hmm. where can people buy your books, Robin? They can only get them online, um, 
Uh, they can get them signed from me at robinhorsfull.com. There's no E in Horsfall. And uh, just put the name in Google. Or if they don't want to um, pay for the signed copies, they just need to put my name into Amazon. And they come up. Bastards. Get the signed <laughs> copy. For anybody watching, I'll leave the links in the description. Where do you go forward for the future, Robin? Uh, keep writing. Keep blogging. Keep fighting for the Northern Irish veterans, the Northern Ireland veterans. And... Um, and uh, see where life takes me. It's an extraordinary life you've lived, and I love these stories, and obviously you've suffered a lot of pain in your life, but you've not let it defeat you, and that's what it's all about. I had a woman on earlier who was trafficked from Yugoslavia. The Serbians took her away, mm. trafficked her. They were going to sell her, but she was abused for six months straight. She escaped. This is one thing I love about the UK as well. The UK had then brought her over to the UK. Mm. They gave her free health support. They fixed her up and now she's thriving in life. And I don't think we get enough credit. Listen, the UK can be on its ass sometimes. We get it. There's a lot of bad shit. But there's also a lot of good stuff that we do. And I don't think a lot of people touch on that enough. And uh, But what an extraordinary woman. She re released a book called Unbroken and yeah. just strong, strong. Yeah. And she, what kept her alive was her love for her parents because they didn't know where she was took. And they would be a life sentence with the mm -hmm. worry. So she ended up escaping and phenomenal story. But would you like to finish up on anything? Well, the, the Muslims teach you that all civilized behavior is built on a family. And it um, doesn't matter what you do in life. The toughest thing you'll ever do is build and stick to a family. That's the strongest thing and the toughest thing you'll ever do in your life. It's funny because she was Muslim. She was Muslim. It's mad because family has everything and it took me many years, like I said earlier, just to realise, okay, that's that's my people. Mm. That's me. I don't need to be anybody else. I can still have a bit of ego and still be trying to always win and sometimes I'll be hard on myself, but that's what keeps me going and I know I'm doing good things. I just Sometimes it's scary. Mm. It's fucking life is scary. Do you ever feel scared with all the shit you've been through or do you just kind of deal yeah. with that? Yeah, I've had, I've had times when I've been scared. Um you know, but um, you learn to cope with fear. Courage is not being, uh, courage, bravery is not being, is, is not about not being frightened. It's about controlling your fear. So mad people who aren't scared, psychopaths, not scared, they're not brave. They're just, they're just, they're just crazy. Um, and they, they're functional as well. They tend to operate in battlefields and in governments, but they're not brave. The brave people are the ones that are genuinely scared and still go forward and take risks for their friends, for their family, for their countries, for their comrades, you know. For anybody watching, Robin, who's maybe in a life of struggle right now, who doesn't really know how to get out, what advice would you have for them? Talk to people. Ask for help. Listen to people that want to help you. And start to deal with the little things first. Jordan B. Peterson says clean up your own room and um he's right you know find make a list of little things that you can achieve between today and tomorrow and um tick off the ones you achieve and then make a new list tomorrow and tick off the next ones and then after that and after that and when you start to achieve tiny things in life you become self-satisfied and you start to build um a pyramid of success um it's taking those little steps um, whether it be drugs, whether it be disease or illness or um, psychological problems or just some of the shit that happens to you in life, start again and talk to people. Yeah, Robin, that's an extraordinary man, extraordinary life. I wish you nothing but the success you set out to be. More books, more adventures and <laughs> listen, fair play for kicking on and still doing what you're doing. I wish you all the best. God luck. Thanks, Jim. Take care. Thank you. Appreciate it.